So exploitation, and I mean that, of course, in the, in the musical sense, getting, getting the music out there, um, the market's really efficient at this. What we're faced with now, and, and you guys were talking about this uh, moments ago, you know, before I started prattling on, um, excuse me, was this idea that it's decentralized. It's no longer going to be the major labels in their distribution systems, right? Caroline, EMI's quasi-independent distributor, just fired all their field staff, all of them, gone, goodbye, okay? And they did that because, you know, what do we need these guys for? There aren't a whole lot of record stores out there, although Tower apparently is going to reopen a bunch of superstores, which is a good idea. Um, but there aren't a whole lot of record stores out there. So the decentralized way, people bringing CDs in and putting them on shelves, which seems like a really quaint idea these days to me at least, right? I know, I have a store. I will buy some CDs and put them on a shelf and hope that some people come in and buy them. Does that seem odd to you, right? How many will you buy? I don't know. I'm going to buy 27 and hope that 27 people come in and buy this CD. It's really, really bizarre, and yet that's the way it worked forever. And of course, it doesn't make any sense anymore. And as we move towards people selling off of their own websites, and hopefully not off of MySpace, it becomes decentralized. It moves to these mavens, the people that are right on the front line of the music, the innovators, the people that are thinking about differentiated product, going, I love this music, and rather than have an MP3 blog and giving it away, I'll sell it for 35 cents. I'll keep five cents and I'll give the artist 30 cents. And then we have the most killer record industry we've ever had. So the decentralized stuff, and again, this is kind of dated, um, but you know, these people are still around, um, you know, if, if by a thread. As, as Professor Snyder said, I don't think the serious um, XM merger will go through. And if that happened, if it doesn't go through, they're, they're both going to be a problem. Um, and then if, if the, you know, uh, Sound Exchange does manage to shut down webcasting. You know, we'll figure this stuff out. These are bumps in the road. The RIAA, I think, I think Professor Snyder used the, the expression, they're just putting their fingers in the, in the dam. They can't stop this. But the music's coming from, from everywhere now, rather than from centralized places. So the innovators can find a profit-seeking distributor who will put money above prejudice or grudges. Right? That's the secret. And this is where it gets okay to be a capitalist. It doesn't, you know, get you into heaven necessarily, but it does help you to get the music out there. And I was going to show the Nick Drake Volkswagen commercial, but I don't have sound, so I'm not going to do it. Anybody seen that? You know what I'm talking about? And it's a good example, and, and I was fortunate to work on that catalog. This is an artist, those of you who don't know, that killed himself in the 70s um, because no one ever listened to his music, right? And then in 1999 or 2000 or something, we got a call from Volkswagen saying, hey, we want to use um, a Pink Moon in, a, in an ad for you know, Volkswagen. And we said, no, you know, Nick's music is not supposed to be for ads. And they called back and said, would you just look at the storyboard? Said, all right. And the storyboard was, you know, you've all seen it, kids driving up to a party and turning around and driving away, right? And so I called them up and I said, so is there going to be a voiceover, you know, buy the new cabriolet or whatever? And they said, no, no voice, no nothing, just Nick in the image. And I said, oh, well, that, that sounds okay. So we talked to Nick's uh, sister um, and, and she said, well, why don't you go ahead and do it? So they paid us a little bit of money, not a lot. And as I say, this was an artist that was selling about, you know, five, ten thousand 10,000 CDs a year. Um, within about three months of the, of the ad running, we were selling 100,000 CDs. And it kept going, and it became the longest, longest running uh, VW commercial that they ever, ever aired. They still show it occasionally. And we ended up selling about a million Nick Drake records. Um, I have big problems with, with you know, using music for commercials. Um, but I don't see anything bad about, you know, you all know Nick Drake largely because of this commercial. Some of you knew him before it, or irrespective of the commercial. But there was a commercial you know, um, incentive, an economic incentive to use this and get it out there, and it was a way to get the music out. I'm sure you guys spend a ton of time talking about synchronizations and the use of, of music that way. It is these people with the economic drive that says this music will fit, and the question is how do we make that a long-term sustainable thing? And the answer is to work with niches. The other thing the market does really well is provide a profit to those who preserve, right? And so reissues become something that, that's really relevant here. Um, okay, Robert Johnson. I don't know if we'd be hearing Robert Johnson if it weren't for an economic incentive. 
if it was, again, just a, kind of the government or some patron system determining what was valuable art, maybe they would have picked Robert Johnson, maybe not. But Sony Legacy decided, you know what, I think we can sell some of these. So let's take the 27 or whatever tracks there are, put them in a box. This was a huge box set. Metropolis was one of the most important films ever made. It was made in 1927 when King Video, and I always think it's Criterion, but whoever decides, okay, well, let's put this out. They went and they spent a fortune to refurbish this film, and now you can look at this movie, you can rent this movie, um, and see it in about as good a condition as if you were seeing it in 1927. The sole reason for that is because they thought they could sell some of them. It wasn't because, you know what's really important? Metropolis. Right? So, you should, many of you should take some, some kind of, you know, hope in this, right? The virtues of cultural markets lie not in the quality of mass taste, but rather in the ability of artists to find minority support. This minority support, and by that I mean small groups of people, um, are those mavens. And your job is to find those mavens, find those evangelists, find people that love your music and that are willing to tell others about it. Those people then allow you to disseminate it out and you become able to connect with the masses. It's so competitive that you've got to demassify. You can't just say, you know what my marketing strategy is? Get on MTV and Rolling Stone. It doesn't work, right? It's about demassifying, making diverse products, because the market can't stand bland, right? Lily Allen, Amy Winehouse, all of the stuff that's starting to get some traction. <coughs> it's not because they're horribly original, they're just not bland. Okay, and just to, to finish up, um, the role of government, because this brings it back full circle. If you take the market out of it and say, you know what, we should, we should get grants, we should just let, you know, why can't, why can't the government give me money to make my art, right? Doesn't this government value art more than, than you know, commerce? The answer is it really shouldn't, right? Um, it does its best when it's just another customer. And by that, I mean, if they want to buy your music and put it in a museum or buy a painting or whatever, fine. But when they start becoming arbiters of taste and saying this is better than something else, they get it wrong, invariably. And the examples of that are the countries that do this, Germany and France. When was the last time you guys heard some good German music? Right? When was the last time you heard some good French music? It doesn't happen because it happened before the niches and stuff were happening and you didn't have as many choices, but now that the market is so open and disseminated, these are just putting up barriers for people to innovate. The government, when they get involved, make it bureaucratic. <laughs> we don't want our art bureaucratic, right? That's art by committee. And art by committee is, what is it, a, ca a camel or an elephant or something? It's something that doesn't make any sense. Right? And we all know this. We live in New Orleans where a lot of stuff doesn't make sense because the government is trying to tell us how to make art. Politics, right? This is New Orleans. Politics seeks stability, compromise, and consensus. No politician is going to go out on a limb and say, I think what New Orleans needs is more emo or even more hip hop. Isn't that awful? Because that's precisely what New Orleans means. What are, what are politicians in New Orleans going to say we need more of? Do we? <laughs> 